Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as you join, feel free to put your name and where you're from in the chat. Introduce yourself a little. I am Rob. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to see so many of you on a Saturday from all over, too. We were just counting. I think it's 25 different countries that are with us today, which is pretty awesome. Oh, it's good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Jay, it's good to see you again. Seeing some new faces, which is very cool. Welcome. Ah, uh, yes, and not only where you're from. Uh, also, if you want to put where you, where you teach, what you teach, rather. Um, I know a lot of us are physics teachers, but I also know a lot of us are not only teaching physics. So it's always interesting to see uh, who might be in the same boat as you. Ah, a couple people from New Jersey, right across the uh, right across the river from me. I'm over over in New York, not too far from y'all. Astrophysics. So I we have a, if there's uh, anyone from the UK. I feel I feel like I'm the sole representative of uh, <laughs> Great Britain here today. You get you get the signatory vote. <laughs> oh great okay well usually we have a couple of participants from the uk excellent somebody from yeah, 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 Hanson. <laughs> we got a got a good spread of people so i uh i would like to get rolling we have a great talk uh, i've been looking forward to this for a while um Simon is somebody who popped up in our core group conversation um, a while back about offering the viewpoint of, you know, physics in areas that we may not view as physics right away. So it's going to be a very interesting talk, especially because, you know, Simon is a science communicator, not necessarily a teacher in the classroom, but that by all means does not mean he is a teacher. Uh, the amount of stuff that I've learned personally from his YouTube channel um, is crazy, and my students love it. Um, I would like to read just one thing that Simon wrote in his book, uh, Firmament, and then uh, I'm going to give it off to him. But this is, uh, I got the book shortly after Simon agreed to this, uh, and then I opened the book and read this and texted a few people in our group, and they're like, yep, we made the right choice. Uh, so what I said is, book dedicated to Harry Backhouse, my eight, year eight English teacher who patiently sat with me on his lunch break to edit my stories and to all the teachers around the world, uh, you make the future. And today I think we get to turn the tables and let Simon uh, give us something that we can be, bring back to our classrooms and our environments. So without further ado, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, I was saying before uh, everybody jumped on the call, I completely in awe of people who can do this full time. She's uh, not a physics teacher. She teaches uh, French and Spanish at high school. Um, so I, it's a real privilege to, to speak to you. And thank you for giving up some of your Saturday um, to, to hear me wobble on. Um, so I thought, actually speak of the devil, she's literally just come home. I need to shut my door. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, so um, I've, I've titled this talk Falling Upwards because um, that's that's what it's felt like over the past 10 to 15 years um, that I at one point was a very respectable person doing my PhD and um, about 
10 years ago or so, it felt like gravity sort of flipped and I inexorably was drawn into this new path of doing science communication online. Um, and perhaps the best way to demonstrate that um, is to compare two weeks. So um, I'm going to compare a week as I was in 2014 and a week uh, this, this past week, this year. So this was me in 2014, full of hope, young. Um, and uh, the week was pretty simple. I'd go into the PhD office every day. I would read papers. This was the start, the first year of my PhD. So I was pulling together resources from my literature review, reading a lot of science. Um, I would maybe extract some equations from those papers, have a fiddle with them, maybe try to derive something new to try and impress my supervisor. Um, I would do a little bit of coding to analyze some data, either from the climate model or from reanalysis, some observations. And uh, maybe I'd spend a little bit of time on the weekend editing a video on what it was like to do a PhD uh, on my sort of little side hustle YouTube channel. And then uh, this year, this was the me earlier this week. That's, um, uh, I was going to say it's a London bus. They're just very heavily armed. No, that's that's HMS Belfast in the centre of London. Um, and my week was very different. Um, I'm currently writing a video on the Lorenzo tractor, talking about the butterfly effect and what people miss about it. I filmed a video this week about my new studio because uh, I have just secured for the first time ever some production space for have some work-life separation. Um, I was researching a video about the upcoming European parliamentary election. I was on HMS Belfast to receive an award uh, from the Royal Meteorological society for my psychom and um giving a talk obviously to you guys and maybe being able to do some coding at some point so clearly something went very wrong uh because i am no longer a respectable scientist or student i am some youtuber person so i thought that in this talk i could basically answer three uh questions uh, i wanted to try and explain what happened uh, how i ended up in the situation i wanted to spend a fair bit of time talking about my approach to making stuff um, and specifically that leads to how I try to get people to care about the climate and uh, approaching this from a sort of scientific perspective. So to answer that first question about what happened, to rewind a little bit further into the past, um, I uh, was once a, a student at the University of Oxford. I did my master's degree and undergrad at St. Peter's College, which looks like that. Um, and as part of that course, I, uh, my fourth year, I had to specialise into two subjects, and I chose atmospheric and theoretical physics. I basically fell in love with atmospheric physics in my third year and uh, determined that that was what I wanted to do and decided that I wanted to do a PhD uh, and was given funding to do so uh, studying stratospheric dynamics at the University of Exeter. If anyone would like to ask me about research afterwards, I'm more than happy to talk about it. But I was basically looking at how two layers in the atmosphere interact with each other dynamically. And we, we came up with a new framework to describe it. Um, and originally, I had well, I started the PhD fully intending to stay in academia and do a postdoc and become a full time research scientist. But Alongside the academic stuff, I've already hinted at this, there was another thing that I was doing as a little side hustle. I was making videos. Um, as a kid, I watched a lot of YouTube. Um, YouTube was founded in 2006, so I was a teenager then, and I watched a lot of the early stuff. And um, eventually, I started making my own videos. Uh, after I spent one term at Oxford, I made a video talking about what it was like to be a state school student, so not a private school student, um, at Oxford, and what my experience was like applying, and this is what life is like, with the intention of trying to help people apply. Um, so it was quite specifically a sort of improving access initiative. And it got really big. That that video immediately blew up. It got like 100 views. And I thought that there was probably a chance that I could make some more videos like this. So I made a couple more. Um, I did other videos. For example, I made two videos talking through my interview questions at Oxford, which did get me in trouble because um, I interviewed at a different college. And it turned out they used the same interview questions every year. Uh, they weren't very happy about the fact that I posted them online, but um, my tutor had my back, which was, you know, very nice, a nice confidence boost. And um, I eventually sort of experimented with a vlogging format. So um, this culminated once I'd left Oxford and I was at Exeter. I made this video. 
um, uh, which was a week as a PhD student, a week in the life of a PhD student. And um, this was a continuation of a format that I'd done previously. I did a day in the life of an Oxford physics student before, um, and I thought a week would be seven times better. So it was it was surefire to be a hit. Um, and it did turn out to be quite successful, uh, sort of covering what I was doing in my research, explaining what the PhD was about, but also my side projects. So I was a choral scholar. I sang for the university. I got up stuff you know, behind the scenes with friends. And um, it was pretty successful. It got a few hundred thousand views in the first six months. Um, and this was the point where my YouTube side of things really took off. Um, there is this saying uh, I really like about this kind of success, which is that overnight success takes a really long time. Um, this was when a lot of people found me for the first time with this series, but uh, this was the 213th video that I had posted on my YouTube channel. Um, one of the truest and hardest pieces of advice I was ever given was if you are a creative in some medium, say YouTube videos, your first hundred videos will suck. And once you get over that fact, that's a good thing because each video you make mistakes, you improve, you each video becomes iteratively better. Um, it, clearly I was a slow learner because my 101st video wasn't the first good one. Apparently it was the 213th. Um, and um, it, this this spawned a successful uh, series of videos. That was the next one. No prizes for guessing when I filmed that one as a choral scholar. It was quite an interesting time with you. And um, this was when my YouTube channel really kind of kicked into high gear and I started getting quite a few views on videos. So when it came time for my graduation, which naturally I made a video about, um, I basically had this choice. Um, I, I could choose to stay in academia and do a postdoctoral position, uh, but I didn't really have the best time during the PhD. I didn't particularly enjoy it, didn't have the best relationship with my supervisor. Um, and at the same time, I had this YouTube channel and I had about 80,000 subscribers by the time I submitted. And I figured that, well, I don't really want to do a postdoc and that's quite a lot of subscribers. It wasn't enough to consider doing this as a full-time job, but I figured that I'd regret not trying to do it. So I made the leap and I decided that uh, after graduation, I'd give it a go for a couple of months trying to make videos about, well, whatever I thought was interesting as a full-time job. And um, originally I attempted to keep vlogging uh, sort of the same type of thing that I made when I was a student. But this wasn't particularly successful because my life was suddenly a lot less interesting because I wasn't took a PhD anymore. Uh, and instead, the videos that actually started to do well were those that were very explicitly about science. Um, I did a series of videos. This was the first one in the series about which planets from fictional universes could really exist. So this was Star Wars planets. Um, and I think initially it was quite a slow burn. That one didn't get very many views, but over the coming months, it really picked up and that became a massive source of subscribers for the channel. So um, I leaned into that. I was very fortunate in that video um, and others. I was able to work with sponsors. So Brilliant.org has supported me for a very, very long time, as have people like Nebula. Um, and I was able to make this into a, a full-time gig, basically. Um, and eventually settled on a a set of formats and a set of subjects that I felt comfortable talking about and people liked hearing from me about. So that is centered on physics. That has been my background and very specifically talking about earth science and climate change specifically. My research wasn't on climate change, but you can't research anything in atmospheric science and not intersect with climate in some way. And so over the course of my PhD, I did learn quite a bit about the subject. And as I've been making more and more videos, I've become much better learned and I've become uh, more educated about the minutiae of the problem. So um, that was the uh, the first couple of years. Some recent projects that I've worked on top left, this was a long video essay I made about the possible redemption arc for coal mining, about how you can use coal mines as a source of geothermal heating to decarbonize heat supply here in the UK. Uh, I did a video on the environmental impact of electric bikes. That one on the bottom left was a particularly ambitious project. That's an hour long documentary I made uh, about a possible 21st century, a hopeful vision of the 21st century told as a retrospective history History, where we overcome climate change and we limit the warming to safe levels, which was a huge collaborative project. And then if you're interested, actually, in the um, more SciComm side of things, I actually started a podcast last year called How to Make a Science Video, where we talk to expert uh, communicators from different fields um, about how they make their specific content. So people like Tia Zhu, um, in season two, which is currently being edited, we've got people like Hank Green, Maddie Moat, 
Uh, there's uh, you know lots of people whose names you may recognize from YouTube. So that's that's uh, I do things other than videos was the reason that I I included that. Um, and what I've learned over the course of doing this, and this is sort of where I'm going to try and bring this back around to a more general message rather than just talking about me uh, like a narcissist for 20 minutes, is my approach. So how I connect all of these videos with a methodology. And the methodology it can be boiled down to a single rule. Um, and perhaps I'm telling my grandmother to suck eggs here as teachers. Perhaps this is something you're very well aware of. But my rule for this is... All communication is storytelling. If you want to communicate a sequence of information to elicit a specific response in your audience, that's a story. Normally, we talk about that sequence of information and that response being fictional and an emotional response. But in my opinion, if you are communicating nonfiction to elicit a intellectual response, it's exactly the same thing. So the same rules apply and you can look at storytelling techniques from fiction and apply them to nonfiction, which I break down into two components. First of all, you've got the format. This is why I sort of made this point earlier about experimenting with different formats on YouTube, but you could also talk about different formats like podcasts or books or, uh, you know, live streams or whatever it is. The format is the first component. It's like the picture frame, if you like. And the story that you're telling is what you put in that frame. And you have to consider both these things critically in order to communicate effectively. Now, there are two rules that I apply to the storytelling aspect. I'll touch back on the format briefly later. But the storytelling aspect is what I find particularly interesting and fun to talk about. Um, this is not something that I have come up with myself. There are these two simple rules of storytelling, which I have stolen shamelessly from this video uh, called F is F for Fake, How to Structure a Video Essay. A very sadly defunct uh, channel now called Every Frame of Painting. All of this channel's videos are absolutely fantastic. But this one in particular is a very uh, concise introduction to this way of storytelling that um, Orson Welles uh, talks about. And they break the storytelling process down into these two rules. Therefore or but, never and then, and meanwhile back at the ranch. Now, I will preface talking about this by saying that the first rule, I think, is by far the most important, and it's the most relevant to all forms of communication, all forms of media. The second one is more relevant for long form, so things like books or hour long YouTube videos, or I guess potentially if you were giving a, an hour long lecture or a class. So perhaps this is actually more relevant to this audience than normally when I talk about this stuff. So the first rule, therefore or but. The idea here is that you break your story into beats. So um, the way that I used to do this was I used to literally take post-it notes and I'd write out the plot points of a video. And the plot point was just whatever I could fit onto a post-it note in a couple of words. And then the rule is you lay out your post-it notes in the order that you're telling your story. And you have to be able to put the word therefore or the word but between each post-it note. If you can put the words and then between any two story beats, then the story is not structured properly. Because if you've ever heard a toddler tell you a story, it's this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and then this thing happened, and then this thing happened. And it's not an engaging way to communicate information. Whereas if you have this thing happens, but this thing happened, therefore this thing happened, therefore this thing happened, suddenly there's logical continuations and reversals of fortune. And um, it's just a more effective way of communicating a story in fiction or nonfiction to an audience. So just in case uh, that that wasn't clear, I like giving this example from The Empire Strikes Back. Spoilers, but if we're physics teachers, we've all seen The Empire Strikes Back. Um, so uh, the rebels are hiding on the planet Hoth, but the Empire discovers them. Therefore, our heroes uh, evacuate on the Millennium Falcon, but the Empire chases them. Therefore, they flee into this asteroid field. So it's not just this thing happened, then this thing, then this thing, then this thing. Sure, you could describe it like that, but that misses these reversals of fortune and these logical consequences. So this is how I structure every video I make. I, I write out the beats and then I put these therefore a but between and I fiddle around until it, it works. That second rule, meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, is a phrase from Hitchcock. And the idea here is that you split a narrative, which is easier to do in fiction than in nonfiction, um, into different threads. You build one thread with therefore or but, therefore or but, up to the point of maximum tension when your audience has to find out what happens next. And then you drop it and you move on to the next thread. And you do the same thing, therefore or but, therefore or but. And you bring that to maximum tension and drop it. And eventually, in the final act of whatever it is you're writing, you tie those threads together with the, the final act being like three act structure stuff. Um, 
And this is sort of easy to do in fiction because, you, you know, you can have different characters in different places doing different things. But in nonfiction, the way that I try to do this is have either different perspectives on the same topic or have different aspects of the story. So having a historical aspect, the scientific aspect, the social aspect, bringing it to the point where it's very interesting, dropping it, move on to, say, the historical point next. Um, to give you an example here again, Within The Empire Strikes Back, The Millennium Falcon, we pick up where we left off, flees into the asteroid field. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Luke lands on this swamp planet, finds a weird frog who promises he can help, but he can only do it after lunch. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, turns out the falcon is in the belly of a space slug and he has to, it has to fly out, goes through the teeth in that really cool shot. Meanwhile, Luke, uh, it turns out, has met um, a really powerful Jedi Knight who agrees to train Luke. Meanwhile, the falcon is being pursued by ships. So hopefully you, you get the idea. Um, but you can do exactly the same things in fiction and in nonfiction. And when I've done long format videos, when I've written the book, I've tried to incorporate this idea to effectively, with the, the, the idea with both of these rules, is you're trying to maintain viewer interest. Um, and these are just two particularly effective ways of doing that. But the, the key thing that I always stress to academics when I talk about this is um, it's exactly the same for fiction as in nonfiction. Um, the, in friction, you have the luxury of being able to write the story however you want. Obviously, we, we can't do that. Um, we need to instead consider how we're framing a given subject. So when I'm writing a video, um, and even if this is a video about, for example, climate change, or I did, I did a, a good example of this is I did a video on Milankovitch cycles, or more properly, Kroll Milankovitch cycles. But instead of framing the video about that science, I framed it about James Kroll, who was this, this, this Scottish janitor who came up with a key part of this theory. He is much more interesting as a story hook than the idea of a Milankovitch cycle, because we are social apes. We are drawn to stories about other people. And so um, by framing the story around him, it was much more effective and it reached much more people. Um, the, the, the point about framing is that, you know, you could be creative with how you frame your story and where you choose to focus, whether you're on um, a protagonist or whether you're sort of pitching a scientist against the establishment or, or whatever it is. You can be creative, but you should never embellish. You, you shouldn't just make stuff up in order to make a more convincing story. I'm not interested in doing that. Um, I suppose if you're making stuff Perhaps this is YouTube specifically. Perhaps it is actually more relevant. Um, for a YouTube title, you reduce your story down to one single question that your audience must have answered. And ideally, you put that at the start of your video. And when I've given lectures before, um, this is something I do sometimes try to do, is you sort of have your opening slide, you state the problem, um, and you you have like a little sting in the tail that the audience has to pay attention in order to find out the answer for. This has worked for me. I appreciate that this is very different if you are teaching in a live classroom environment. But um, for, for YouTube, at the very least, and for other formats that I've worked in, that I think is the crux of it. It's boiling that story down to one sentence, one question. Um, but also, uh, this is something that you learn by doing. As I mentioned, you have to make 100 bad videos before you can make your first good video, or 212 videos in my case. Um, and much as it's, it's fine talking about this in abstract, this is something that you fundamentally get good at by just trying to do it. So I mentioned that I would, um, that's, those are the two rules of storytelling. I mentioned that I would touch on format. Um, this is the part that I think a lot of people underthink and they don't consider this enough. And I think it hampers their science communication efforts. Um, this is where my teacher wife exerts her influence on me because I do think of videos as learning objectives. At the top of uh, you know, at the top of each script page, I write bullet points for these are the two or three learning objectives that I, I want my audience to come away with. And then underneath that, I will also write out a characteristic of the audience that I'm trying to reach, which could be a demographic, it could be an age, a location, but it could be a pre-existing interest. So that video I did about the planets of Star Wars, for example, the learning objectives there were, I want to talk about geological history, I want to talk about planet formation and what makes a planet habitable. But the target audience was very specifically people who have watched Star Wars and then a little bit of detail in terms of that probably means they skew younger, it probably means they skew male. Those pieces of information then determine um, how I can most effectively reach that audience. But that only works if you also consider the format that you are putting that information in, the frame that you put that information in to reach that specific audience. So on YouTube, I made that video matching uh, the style of similar videos that that audience is used to consuming in terms of video essays. Um, 
and so yeah that, that, that's the broader point here is um consider who the audience is what they already know about your subject but also how they typically consume media you know what kinds of videos or what what formats do they do they consume whether that be podcast or live stream or book or whatever it is and once you have a really good idea of that and your learning objectives and the target audience in my experience it kind of writes itself and you have a very clear idea of how to effectively reach that audience with those learning objectives um to give you some examples um i did a video a few years ago uh which was looking through comments left on my channel um and this was aimed at a quite low science capital audience it was aimed at people who watch reaction content on youtube that's a that's a whole genre in case you're, you're not aware um typically young typically people who are not very interested in science but by matching the style of the video with me having the laptop in front of me having the comments come down as people do on other reaction channels um it made though that particular audience feel at home and it allowed me to then in responding to those comments talk about uh, quite abstract ideas and be confident that people were going to stick with me because they think oh well i've watched videos like this before i feel comfortable uh an example that uh is a bit more interesting is uh, i did this video which is part of a series of what i call trojan horse videos um climate science on youtube is quite strongly bifurcated there is a massive cluster of people who are talking about the science and often they are scientists doing it and on the other end there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation um, from various organizations those two sides of youtube are quite disconnected and what i try to do with these trojan horse videos is if you like tunnel through the algorithm and reach the other side so by titling a video and giving it a thumbnail that is recognizable as something that would appear on that other side of the algorithmic mount algorithmic mountain it puts that audience at home they think oh this is the kind of content i normally watch i'll give it a click and then you have about two to three minutes of making it appear that this is a video of the sort that they're used to watching and then you flip the script on its head and start hitting them with actual science and uh but hopefully by that point the sunk cost fallacy kicks in and they will actually stick around and learn something and given by the comments on those videos uh it's certainly reaching that audience quite how effective i am at actually changing people's minds i'm not so sure about but you know at least the first step is there and i'm reaching that audience so this is that that's that's ultimately of course what i wanted to, to get at today which is how you you use these techniques and get people to care about climate this is my area of 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 science and this is the graph that i always show people um the comforting and terrifying reality of this graph is that the more carbon you put into the atmosphere the relationship with warming is approximately linear which is very comforting in the fact that if you stop putting carbon into the atmosphere the warming is probably going to stop like you know it's going to it's going to stabilize at that point there's some argument about warming in the pipeline but as far as we can tell it's pretty much linear however that also tells you that if you don't stop putting carbon into the atmosphere the warming will continue so that's the chart that I always like to sort of show people as a simplification of the issue. Because here's the thing, if you're doing science communication about climate change, climate is, is what some people call a wicked problem. It's almost like somebody designed a problem to, that humans would be bad at solving because it is so vast. It takes place on a global scale. It takes place on long time scales. It takes place certainly on longer time scales than politicians are elected. And it has, in the grand scheme of things, relatively minor direct impacts that cascade into large secondary impacts and our brains aren't built for that but for those kinds of problems our brains are built to forage for berries with about 100 like-minded individuals in a forest not to deal with the impending collapse of the biosphere and so you know how on earth do you take that vast problem and condense it down into something that people can engage with well that's one example i told you a story with that graph try to boil it down to a key factor and what I try to do with each one of my project, projects, whether that be a video or a book or whatever it is, is treat it as a story. And sometimes the protagonist is a scientist. Sometimes the viewer is the protagonist. Sometimes the protagonist is a, a location or a species. And you get the viewer invested in that specific story. And that then allows you to branch out to larger concepts. So this video about um, the butterfly effect, for example, I'm trying to frame it as a video about Edward Arendt and this amazing discovery that he had. And it was a very personal experience that he had discovering chaos theory. But that's just the nucleus of the video. The interesting bits to me and the learning objectives are achieved by what 
getting people interested in that nucleus allows you to accomplish. So that, that that's that's one example. I suppose more broadly, the other thing I try to do is tell stories that find the intersections between climate and some other thing that a person has direct personal experience of, whether that be sport or video games or cooking or transport or whatever it is, finding that overlap between how climate impacts somebody's activities on earth and um, basically what they're interested in learning about. And that allows you to target very specific audiences with each video, um, as I put in the next bullet point. Um, and I suppose the overarching thing that I try to do with this is between those videos, tell a story of contextual hope. That's all, well, the other reason I like this diagram is it's contextual hope, because it's not enough to just beat people over the head with how terrible the situation is. It's, it's not useful to do that. What is useful is to tell people, this is the situation we are in. These are the projected impacts. But this is what we can do about it. This is what people are already doing about it. And this is how we can improve. So it's providing people with the, uh, the, the literature on the subject, but also what the industry and what society are doing with that information. And the way that I conceive of this at the moment, at least, is I, I see this as being a race between two exponentials. <clears throat> so the red exponential here is negative impacts on our environment. Sorry, one sec. And um, Daniel Kahneman makes this point in uh, Thinking Fast and Slow that we humans are incredibly bad at exponential curves. We're really bad at actually getting a sense of being at the thin end of the thick, the thick wedge, how bad things are going to get. And we are at the moment towards the thin end of that thick wedge. And that's the thing that a lot of people focus on in discussing the climate crisis. What I think is missed is the green curve, or I should say curves, because this is the escalating and um, you know quite astonishingly rapid at the moment rollout of climate solutions, of things like renewables, of nature-based solutions, of decarbonizing transport and heating and food supply. The way that I see the problem at the moment is that you have these two exponential curves, one of which is pretty well determined. We have a pretty solid idea of what's going to happen at different tenths of a degree of warming. What we have a much lower certainty about is how we are going to respond to that warming. And I could see one potential curve in which our response is not sufficient and the warming gets the better of us and we're going to see some really truly awful things this century and next century. But there is another curve in which our response is sufficient and it's a more optimistic future, like I depict in that um, hour long video that I mentioned. And what I try to do, I suppose, with my videos is tell stories about the intersection of those curves, about how we can bring our response up to being sufficient. And that is a huge story that needs to be told in multiple different parts uh, and it takes multiple people to do it. Just having one pasty white guy from England doing that is not an appropriate response and not appropriate coverage of this problem. Um, and what I've done today has been all right. Um, I've got lots of things that I would like to do going forward. As I already mentioned, I've um, just got this new studio space and I'd like to try and reflect my um, learning journey, a phrase that I always hated when I was a student and I've really come around to um, through actually learning about a subject and learning about solutions and reflecting that in the videos, because that then allows a new protagonist, which is me, and I can be an audience proxy for learning about this stuff. Um, there are lots of creators who do this in a very interesting way on YouTube already. Uh, as I've already said, uh, that those intersections between climate and other areas, I'd like to lean more into that. I'd also like to signal boost more academics. Um, what I try to do with some of my videos is basically take a research paper and say to people, hey, this has been published, it's not really in language that you can understand, but let me try and translate it and let me make you aware of what's going on in this field of, of climate research. I'd like to do more of that. And I'd also like to produce more short form content because um, if I'm seriously trying to engage with a young audience who are, to be clear, there is value to be had in engaging with all audiences of different ages and different demographics, but I think I see a particular value in trying to engage with those younger audiences to keep the momentum going um, for climate activism. Um, if I'm serious about doing that, then I need to make TikToks or make more TikToks, I suppose, uh, because uh, YouTube videos are increasingly a um, a thing for millennials and not quite quite so for Gen Z. Um, 
But that's basically what I wanted to get through. Just to briefly summarize, I accidentally fell into doing this. I had every good intention in the world of becoming a scientist and um, at PhD graduation thought that I'd give it a go and have muddled my way through up to this point. My first 212 videos sucked. Well, they didn't suck. They were all right. Uh, but that's just an important thing to take away from doing this. Um, I think the key thing, if you're going to take anything away from this, is that communication is storytelling. That's what I say to every academic. If you want to make people care about science, that's what you've got to do. You've got to tell them a story. Um, and there has never been a greater need for targeted science communication. Uh, you know, that we are, I am talking about a subject that has massive implications for the audience that I'm trying to reach with this. And um, time is of the essence. This decade is really when we get to make the big decisions about what the rest of the decade, the century is going to look like. And apparently I forgot to write a final bullet point. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please do like, comment and subscribe. And I think we've got plenty of time for questions. So thank you for listening. I will. Shall I stop sharing my screen or what would you like me to do? We should have thought about that. Yeah, if you'd like to, you, if you stop sharing, then we'll have a um, yep. bigger screen for all of us. Um, I see your question, Eric. We'll get to you in just a moment. Uh, just so everybody knows, you can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand um, under the reaction section. Um, and then we'll just go down the list. But we'll start off with you, Eric. Oop, I think you're muted, Eric. So first of all, thank you for that um, truly engaging talk. And I, I, I learned a lot from uh, listening to your points and storytelling. That was that was absolutely, absolutely great. In fact, you brought it up to a climax that I was hoping you'd show one of your videos. Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't subject that to you guys. But uh, that's something that I, I, I guess I can do asynchronously. It, was, it went to, okay, now he's going to show a video. Now he's going, no, no video. So you certainly knew how to uh, how to play my emotions here. I, I was particularly, um, struck by what you said about a Trojan horse to sort of bring skeptics into uh, into uh, into the fold, so to speak. <clears throat> I, and, and, and as I was listening to you um, to you explain that, I, I was thinking, what would it do to somebody who is not a skeptic watching this video being attracted because you know there's a hook in the title and then the first three minutes, you know, Oh, this is a climate denial uh, talk. I'm going to stop watching. Or maybe that your rule that you design your video specifically for one audience and one audience only holds true. And, you know, it should just be for the climate deniers rather than for the people who are not climate deniers. So what is your mindset when you embark on making such a video? Yeah, it's a it's something that I'm very aware of when I'm writing it. It, it. Those first couple of minutes are really hard to write because you've got to try and not turn off that middle ground audience. I think, I think you do have to write specifically for one audience, um, but not. It's very difficult because you want to do that, but not to the exclusion of a similar but audience that might eventually also be interested. Um, the other thing to, to stress there is that I, in the, no point in those videos do I say anything that's unscientific. Um, it's always... Um, if I do want to say something scientific, it will be through squirrel words or it will be, you know, some people claim this without being specific about it. Um, and it's I'm painfully aware when I'm writing those videos, there is a chance that somebody will watch the first two minutes and then not get to the twist and come away with entirely the wrong idea. So it is something um, th th that's a really fine balancing act. And I haven't done one of these videos for a little while. I've, d I've done a, a few recently where the title and thumbnail are perhaps more provocative but it's quite clear early in the video what the deal is and the fact that i'm approaching this as um not not really as a skeptic but i suppose with an open mind so and a recent example uh, i did a video on uh fake meat um you know how green are meat substitutes actually and trying to present the first couple of minutes as well i'm going to come into this with an open mind and not assume that they are uh, they are lower carbon or whatever and then quite rapidly going into the data um, which has been effective so far. I think this is an approach that um, I'm iterating on, um, not least because it's emotionally exhausting reading YouTube comments from skeptics. Because that's the that's the problem with my job is that if I'm effective at reaching climate skeptics, my life becomes awful. 
you know, the, the, the better I am at my job, the worse my life gets. Um, so it's been nice to actually be more targeted to people who are... The, the word that my friend Rohan uses here is people who are, who are ignorant. Not to say that they are stupid, but to mean that they just don't have a specific knowledge about this topic. They might be interested in low carbon solutions, but they might not know, for example, about geothermal heating. To us, at, but well, Jay has asked, just asked a, as a question. I read the comments. I read the comments for about the first 24 hours, typically after a video comes out, because that's when you actually get reasonable feedback. Um, you know, I, I'm very open to, to my core audience who have a good sense of what I am trying to accomplish saying, oh, well, you know, I don't think this worked particularly well, or the audio was a little bit iffy, or I think you could have done this bit a bit clearer. Great. That's really useful feedback. But being told that, you know, climate change is a lie because Hillary Clinton's just brought the entire I don't know, all of Tampa Bay or something, uh, is is just not helpful. So um, I do read them. And then every now and again, I'll dip in um, just to torture myself, just to sort of get a cross section of what people are saying across older videos. Um, the more useful feedback, I think, is actually on Discord. I have a Discord server that's for people who support my work. And um, that's very useful to go through because we actually have a bit more nuanced discussion there. And that's definitely nudged my videos in different directions. Because I do, I do have friends who are creatives who just don't have comments. Or if they, or if they have comments, they just don't read them, which I think is a very dangerous thing i think that's a way basically to guarantee a markov chain of quality like you're just going to be all over the place with what you're actually making um and it's very valuable to have that feedback but for my mental health i have to be quite targeted in how i get that feedback simon i want to jump in on that john put an interesting question in the chat there was a bit of a thread while you were talking um about there used to be videos and such made for classrooms I'm sure we all remember giant laser discs and VHS and all of that. Um, and I didn't notice it until they made the comment that that kind of, you know, stopped about the mm. time that YouTube started up and stuff like that. Um, and I know personally for me and probably many others, there's a lot of things that we watch, your channel, maybe Mark Rober's channel, things like that, that have the science but aren't necessarily geared specifically towards classrooms. Um, and we've had other guests such as Flipping Physics who's geared almost directly towards providing the classroom experience, maybe in people's houses. Um, and the question that he brought up that maybe you can enlighten us with, uh, that maybe many of us didn't think about, is what might be the best way um, to get kind of behind the curtain with content creators on making content that might be more specific for classrooms, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think there's a few ways that you can. Oh gosh, sorry. I have I have thoughts about this, and they're all tumbling around in my head. Um, I think there's a few ways that you can use videos in the classroom, right? I think an effective way that I know my videos are used at university level and some high schools is they're sort of like recommended watching. You know, we're gonna if you if you thought this was interesting, here's a video that has more detail on this. You can watch it in your own time or watch this video ahead of the class so you have like a primer on the subject. Um, in terms of the stuff that is to be used within lessons, it's very difficult because, unfortunately, the people who do this full time basically have to make content that will perform in isolation. It has to perform on YouTube. You know, it has to have the title and the thumbnail and a structure and a length that works like <laughs> it's you know how everything eventually evolves into a crab like all youtube videos recently have evolved into being about 16 minutes long like 16 to 20 minutes that's like the sweet or like four hours if you're contra points or, or someone like that um and so it's just a bit of an awkward length to show in a classroom so i think in terms of having something to show you know in class for one thing i would actually argue that longer tiktoks from you know, actually verified accounts on TikTok, because I know the quality is very varying, um, is actually an appropriate length, perhaps. So rather than YouTube videos, maybe maybe using going to another site. But in in terms of um, you know, like asking a creator, could you do content that was appropriate for a classroom? Like, here's, could you do a three minute snippet that's just this topic? Um, I think you know, Patreon is certainly a way to do that. Um. I'd not really considered that before, but I think if a teacher had signed up to my Patreon and said, hey, could you either snip out this two minute section of your video and upload it just for use in classrooms? Or could you make this video for use in classrooms? Then I'd certainly consider it. Um, it would very much depend creator by creator. Unfortunately, we are 
we have a very finite amount of time, much like teachers themselves. Uh, we only have so much time to to create this stuff, and we have to prioritize the stuff that's actually going to put food on the table. Um, the wonderful thing about Patreon is, of course, that you are freed from that restriction. Um, but in terms of... I don't really have a satisfactory answer to that question, though, in terms of, like, how can we better integrate the, the content from really good YouTube channels and, and mine into the classroom. Because unfortunately you're trying to put like a square peg into a round hole. Um, I wish I had a better answer to that question. I think that in and of itself is an answer that we, we've got to, we have something that might require a solution. And we've got a bunch of people here that might be able to solve that. Um, two people jumped around about the same question, both Paul and Jessica. Um, around kind of how you find information about your audience and how you decide on those demographics or so. Because I know as teachers, we, we're from all sorts of schools. So that is something that we also deal with. Um, you know, my school versus going to maybe crazy schools or Eric's classrooms or Cecilia's classrooms um, are all vastly, vastly different. Um, so how do you go about that? So there's, there's two answers to that. The first answer is... Um... I, I learn a lot from Discord. So we, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about Discord is it, it's compartmentalized. So we have channels that are just for talking about climate or just talking about science or my favorite, just where people post pictures of their pets. Um, and you do get a sense of what the audience is like from those interactions. Um, and also from when I do live streams on like time interactions with people, if I talk about, a, a, you know, something in preparation for a video, oftentimes people will volunteer pieces of information about, you know, what kind of age they are, where they're based, what they do for a living, or if they're a student, what they're studying, what they find interesting. So that's that's a great way um, that the, the, there's a very easy source there for my existing audience. The other answer to that question, though, is that I will often target an audience that isn't part of my core audience. Um, so I'm trying to think of a recent example. Um, I think the Cole video might be an example of that, where I knew, right, this is going to skew a little bit older. Like this, I, I know what I want to accomplish here is actually affect voting intentions and people who are likely to contact the local authority. So like local councils here in England, um, because the point of the video is there's this big thing going on. And if you ask your local authority about this, maybe they could do something about it. And so I skewed it to be appealing to a slightly older audience, which meant changing the style of humor. It meant actually making a lot of Simpsons references because The Simpsons is now somehow 40, 45 years old. Um, and, you know, it was it was a priori just saying that is who I want to reach. So rather than um, uh, going off sort of market research about what uh, the people who are already watching my videos it's right my target and sometimes channels will say right imagine like you're you're the person the specific individual that you want to watch your videos so they might say right the guy who watches my videos is going to be 25 he's an engineer he posts on reddit he has strong opinions about which form of star trek is best like that's the target audience that i specifically want to reach um and some channels will have multiple versions of that they'll have like I'll do three kinds of videos and each type of video has a specific person that I am trying to reach. And then you tailor it to that. But again, you're sort of, you're working a priori to that audience rather than the other way around. Is it, I'm going to butcher your name. And... Hi, my name is Antti, I'm from Finland. Oh, I've got a question good. about, um the use of IA, do you have any use for chat GPT or anything like that in producing your videos? I'm a bit skeptical about it for using in the high school setting because uh, if students are using it for writing essays, that, that doesn't really teach them anything. But I've tried to use it in trying to unpack some scientific articles. I've had some projects in which they had to read scientific articles and then present uh, the essential information and answer some kind of research question based on that. So in that sense, it seems to be when you supply the information, the articles, which are free to use, and then uh, then it gives them back, it gives the students back the essential information for their level, not in the technical level that was in the original paper. It seems to be working and they were quite fascinated with it because they need to do projects uh, later on and they realized that they might be using this later on. But what is your take on this? That's really interesting, actually, because what 
when when you first asked the question, that was one of the things that I immediately thought of. Um, I am I am personally very skeptical about the use of AI in a science communication. I think that there's you're already starting to see on YouTube these uh, channels that are entirely AI. You know, the 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 concepts are written, the scripts are written, and it's performed by an AI voice, it's slapped together. It's very low quality, and it's low quality now. It will probably improve in time. But I don't think humans are going to be replaced from this workforce um, in the same way that, sure, I can go to Tesco's down the road and buy a loaf of bread for 50p and it's going to be fine. But I know that I could go to a bakery and get something that tastes really good. I think that's going to be a similar role for human science communicators. Um, what I personally use AI for, um, I've tried using it to generate titles for YouTube videos and it is shockingly bad at it it's really really bad um like it will come up with the it, it like buzzfeed from 10 years ago kind of titles um what i find it really useful is um finding uh like uh, okay an example i interviewed uh the ceo of project drawdown recently um which is a, this non not profit which um uh, curates a list of climate solutions and basically finds by 2050 using the solution you could draw down this much carbon from the atmosphere in a standardized way it's an amazing project and we talked for about 40 minutes on loads of different subjects and what i found was really useful was taking the transcript of that interview after the afterwards popping it into chat gpt and asking it summarize the key points that we talked about and i found that that was a really useful way to um sort of draw out yeah okay that is the topic that's like the through line that we were actually getting at this whole time i found it's useful for that and i actually find it's useful for when i've written a script sometimes i will put it into chat gpt and ask it to summarize what the script is saying and if it can give a decent summary and you know it actually gets what i was trying to accomplish then i know that i've probably done a good enough job with writing the script. So I definitely see it being useful and hearing that your students can use it to effectively chain, lower the level, the language, technical difficulty of like the text. That's really interesting because that is kind of what I've independently, I suppose, uh, found it also useful for. Um, so I do, I think, it, I, I think it has its uses for sure, but it's definitely not the, the, the ultimate solution to, to everything that I think a lot of people making videos are fearful of. That's really interesting. Um, I know that a lot of us, we, we teach different levels of physics courses, um, but even for new and novice teachers, the idea of putting their lessons into some large language model and seeing if it's giving out what you're saying. Um, and I think there were a lot of crossovers with things that you were saying about how you structure your videos, such as the learning objectives and such as that. Um, and the question I want to ask um, is Pixel Girl, your, your other half that you have, you know, education, uh, or rather she has an education background with, what are some of the conversations, um, or rather the key crossover points between your work and her work that we might be able to take back to our classrooms and to our style of teaching and maybe solving similar problems that you both have faced kind of in this, this gray region. So I think I think my main takeaway from talking to her about this is that I have it so much easier. Uh, it is is much easier not having to interact with children directly. Um, I think the, 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 the point that we actually end up talking about most frequently is differentiation. It's how you keep every member of the class engaged. Um, and so if you have your particularly gifted students, making sure that they're not bored, um, but equally making sure you're not losing people who perhaps are a lower attainment. Um, and with videos that it basically always, it's something I always have to have in the back of my mind now is like, if this was a lesson, it's like, right, let's just repeat a point from earlier to make sure we haven't lost anybody. But also you, you include a minor point to be like, if you're interested, you know, you can read this paper, I'll leave a link in the description kind of thing. So it's, I think that's the the, the crossover for me is, um, is yeah, d differentiation. I'm not sure I would say that she's taken anything from, from my work, because, partly because I'm slightly concerned that she's outside my door and listening to me, and I don't want to, uh, like, flatter myself. Um, but I think they, they are quite different. Um, I, I think 
it's not helped by the fact that she's teaching languages rather than science. Um, I, I know that when we have over lockdown, actually, I helped out with, with some activities and lessons. And I think trying to, uh, but that point about the intersection of, right, this is what you're already interested in, but let's now lean on this other thing to make it interesting. So uh, with, with Spanish, for example, talking about uh, Spanish footballers in the Premier League, and that's like a, a jump off point for some of her students. But again, trying to make that work without actually you know, losing everybody else in the class. To Eric's question, seeing as I'm talking about this now, uh, I haven't made any videos for her classroom. I did help her. <laughs> I did help her with a lockdown activity where she did a Spanish cooking club and um, they did uh, cookery lessons with, with traditional recipes. Uh, and uh, the whole thing was in target language. And I think her students get, got back to her and said, why is this filmed so well? <laughs> Because we use like all of my, I wasn't doing anything else with it. So I was just using all my fancy equipment. But that's the one time I've been allowed to, to contribute to the classroom. <laughs> I love that. Um, and I think many of us would love if you shared those recipes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I think the one that sticks in my head was Torijas. Um, and I think we did quesadillas. There are a couple of other ones. <laughs> so the, I have one more question, unless anyone else wants to interject a question before we wrap up. Um, but the main question I have is, so you've done all this schooling, uh, you've done a career that I would say is in line with your schooling, um, but many may argue, you know, that's not necessarily true. Um, if I bring you, you know, to my classroom of uh, 16 and 17 year old students, uh, once they get past the accent and the giddiness and all of that, uh, what would be your main takeaway, you know, both maybe on the climate side, but also the schooling side and kind of staying positive that they can make a change? Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, first of all, kids don't do a PhD. It's a terrible idea. Um, uh, so I think, you know, from, I suppose, the, the practical schooling side of things, I, I don't think I would tell them anything that you wouldn't already be telling them. You know, it's like, take this stuff seriously. You're going to look back on this and um, these are going to be some of the happiest days of your life. And you will, you don't want to look back and wish that you could have put more effort in or you would wish that you could have done better. Like, really go for it and, and give it your all. Um, in terms of the climate side of things, what I say to students, because uh, I do give talks to sort of a similar kind of age range sometimes, and I always like to say, you are the generation that is going to take over the reins of net zero. Um, hopefully, what is going to happen in the next 20 years or so is you're going to see, at least here in the West, this massive decline in emissions and a massive decline in our impact on the environment more broadly. But then the generation that's currently in charge are going to get out of the way because they're going to retire. And you are the generation that's going to have to pick up the reins and make sure that we stay the course and we actually start to improve the planet rather than just limiting the damage. And that means you need to be educated about this stuff. You are the generation that is going to have to be informed about all these topics in climate science. So that's why you should pay attention in physics classes, why you should pay attention in geography and politics and all these other things. Because, you know, you you, you are maybe one of you is going to be president one day and you're going to have to sign into into to law some piece of legislation that actually keeps us to net zero. But whilst you're on the way to getting to those management positions, you can make a difference. You absolutely can. And the principal way that you can do that is through systems and it's through voting, which can be national, it can be local. Everyone forgets local elections, but they're so important for city, you know, um, city governments, for regional governments, um, you know, here in the UK I already mentioned local authorities, that's a massive impact. And you have a voice that you absolutely should use and you should have an educated voice. So it's another reason to, to make sure that you, you pay attention to this stuff. Um, but, you know, no, to quote Greta Timber, like no person is too small to make a difference. This is a problem that we have all gotten into and we all have a kind of responsibility to get out of, but we can all contribute. So it's um it's it's the, the, the there are reasons to engage with this in the present and in the future and you matter so you know that's that's why you, you should pay attention to this stuff simon i very much want to thank you again uh i'm going to cut that clip out and show it to my students 
Uh, I'll share it with everybody. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, there is, if you look in the chat, there's an exit survey. It helps us figure out, you know, who else we want to get and what teachers are focused on or academics, wherever you are. Um, and this is our last meeting uh, for this academic year. Um, a few of us will be at AAPT in Boston. If you are in the U.S. and attending, please say hello. It'll be nice to meet you. Uh, Simon, if you want to hop the plane and come on over, you know, we'll find <laughs> space for you to hang out. Always wants um, to visit. And, you know, we want to just invite you and anybody you know just to join the Pulse T Network. Uh, it's a completely free network. This is what we do. We're here to help teachers by teachers for teachers at all capacities. Um, and with that, I want to say, you know, thank you again. And I hope everybody enjoys their summer. See you all soon. Take care. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. That was great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. No, my, uh, my, thank you. No, again, thank you for having me. It's um, it's a it's a real privilege to be able to talk to teachers. It genuinely is. So um, I, I hope the that I've been able to be helpful. The privilege is ours. So, <laughs> and we're very grateful that you did this on a on a weekend day. So I I thought initially that your wife was a biology teacher. I, I misunderstood that. I don't know why I made that jump. Uh, no, very, very much languages. Uh, very much. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but my 